Good afternoon and welcome to Sipping with Jamila B. I am your host, Jamila B. And before we get started, if you haven't done it already, don't forget to subscribe to my channel, like and share this video. Okay, so I usually start out my shows by telling you all what I'm sipping on. And today I'm keeping it very simple, just plain old water. That's what I'm sipping on. I had girls night on Friday and I may have overindulged a little with the spirit. So I'm cleansing myself on this beautiful Sunday. So I'm having just water and water is better for me anyway. So, okay. So with that being said, let me get into the show. As many of you know, September is National Sickle Cell Awareness Month. And it's only fitting that I use my platform to spread awareness about a disease that is very debilitating and it is not recognized on the level as other diseases that fall into the same category. Many people's, people are carriers of the sickle cell trait, primarily black and brown people, and they don't even know it. I am a carrier of the trait and so are many of my family members and friends. And I also have family members and friends who have the disease. So I know firsthand how painful this disease can be. So today I am honored to have one of my family members join me in this discussion, my cousin Kimba Gosier, who is the president of Advancing Sickle Cell Advocacy Project, ASAP, a nonprofit located in South Florida that is dedicated to breaking the stigma associated with sickle cell disease, to spreading awareness, and to invoke a change in treatment in the healthcare community. Kimba is also the parent of a sickle cell warrior. And when we say sickle cell warrior, that is someone who is living with the disease. So Kimba, welcome to the show today. Thank you so much, Jamila, for having me. I'm super excited. Thanks. And, and again, I want to say we, we've been having a little bit of technical difficulties. So if there's some delays, don't think that we're not paying attention to what's going on. So <laughs> I just wanted to put that out there. So thank you again, Kimber, for being here. And uh, what, what I want to do is for us to start out with you telling us a little bit about ASAP and what motivated you to start, you know, ASAP <clears throat> sickle cell journey as well. So let me pull up this question. So why are you showing that I can just start speaking? Our organization is called Advancing Sickle Cell Advocacy Project, Inc., short for ASAP. And what you think of, Jamila, when you think of ASAP, you can just tell me what comes to your mind. As soon as possible. When you think, exactly. <laughs> so it's, it's a play on that as soon as possible because the sickle cell community needs so much. We need resources, funding, better treatment, a universal cure, and we need that as soon as possible. So ASAP was established in 2015. We're a nonprofit grassroots organization, and our platform is advocacy and education, spreading awareness on sickle cell disease, and our mission is to change the narrative on sickle cell disease. So we have a whole host of different activities that we do provide education to medical schools, nursing schools, universities with their first, second, and third, fourth year medical students. We go in and we have panel discussions with sickle cell warriors and the medical students to try to bridge that gap that exists, unfortunately, between the medical community and the sickle cell community. We have support groups that we do every two weeks. We have a support group for adults, which is our general support group. Um, it's actually open to anyone who is a supporter and wants to learn about sickle cell disease as well. We have a support group that we do for teenagers with sickle cell disease. And I see one of our teens is logged in now. Hi, Leah. Um, we also have a play date group that we just started with two of our sickle cell warrior moms that run that group. Hi, and that's for Nelson. ages. I'm a third year medical student for, by you. To 11. I'm so happy that we've been able for to that group ASAP for the past two years. This is our second year having our okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's sorry. That's just a video of one of the our medical students from Florida International University who did like a testimonial about how great it was learning from the sickle cell warriors. So mm -hmm. um yeah, we're we we're we're extremely busy and especially this month. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, Kimba, thank you. And um, yeah, I stopped the video because Kimba, I didn't want to have her competing with the video. But as you can see, ASAP stays very busy. So Kimba, if you can give us a little bit of information about, tell us a little bit about your story and your sickle cell journey. Yes. Okay, so uh, some people may have heard this already who have heard me speak before. However, I was a teenage mother and at the time when my daughter was born, I had not met anybody with sickle cell disease. And I did not know that I had the sickle cell trait. So when my daughter was born in, I believe 1988 or 86, 1986, Florida started the mandatory testing for newborns. And that's throughout the United States now. They test all newborns for sickle cell uh, disease, no matter what race you are. So when my daughter was born, they sent a letter to the house stating that my daughter tested positive for sickle cell and that we needed to take her in to get to confirm the diagnosis. So from that point, by me being a teenager, the letter was intercepted uh, by my mother. And so I wasn't told about that until maybe two, two or three months later. And they told me that, OK, we have to take her to the hematologist to confirm this. At, at that time, it still didn't really sink in. I didn't comprehend what that meant. So we took her to Jackson Memorial Hospital and she saw the late um, Dr. Pegolo, Dr. Charles Pegolo, who was a phenomenal physician who's no longer with us. And at that time it was confirmed when she was about six months that yes, she does have sickle cell SS genotype, which is the most, well, the, one of the worst uh, forms of sickle cell is what she had. And that's what they told me. Still didn't really comprehend that. At that time, the Internet wasn't really big. It wasn't a whole lot of information and things like that. Uh, they did tell me different things to watch out for, like, um, you know, if she gets a fever, swollen hands and feet. But at that time, she was almost she was she was almost nine pounds when she was born. So she looked healthy and cute and fat and all that stuff. So I'm like, oh, there's nothing wrong with me. Exactly. I'm like, there's nothing could be wrong with my child. I don't know what they're talking about. So a little bit, I was in denial about that also. So when she turned about maybe a year old, that's when she started having fevers. She didn't start off with pain initially. It started off with a super high fevers, infection, like they couldn't understand like where the fever was coming from. So her first admission, she was like a year and a half old. It was the very first time that she was admitted to the hospital. The pain started when she was about three years old. And I always say like as a parent, there is no greater pain on this earth than watching your child suffer and be in pain and there's nothing you can do about it. Like that is the worst um, pain that you can go through as a parent. So by the time, just fast forward a little bit, by the time she was nine years old, um, my daughter was in the Miami Herald. They did a story on sickle cell disease. And at that time she was nine years old and she had been admitted to the hospital a total of 33 times. That is very hard to comprehend because even when I read that article again recently, I, it was hard to comprehend that, like, wow, she was actually in the hospital 33 times at the age of nine. So that in itself was extremely traumatic uh, for her and myself. Over the years of her journey with sickle cell disease, she's been through a lot. She's She lost her right hip due to something called avascular necrosis is where the sickle cell disease uh, has deteriorated her hip bone. And that happens a lot with people in sickle cell. The, the major joints, the sickle cell can cause deterioration. So it can happen in the shoulders, the hips, the knees. And, and she did have that in her hip. And she ended up having a, hip, a total hip replacement at the age of 17, which is really young. Because when you think about somebody getting a hip replacement, the first thing you think of is like someone who's 80 years old, um, even stroke. Children with sickle cell disease are at very high risk for a stroke. And they have a test called the transcranial Doppler, which is like an ultrasound. And they check the brain waves and things like that. And they can tell now if you if your child is at risk for having a stroke. And that's something else that people aren't aware of, because when you think of stroke, you automatically think of elderly someone who has. All, you're not thinking of a child having these type of complications mm -hmm. um, over the course of the years. I noticed that when my daughter was younger. No one ever questioned if she was in pain or not. It was not an issue when she was when she was younger. We were going to the hospital. It was total catering to, oh, you know, empathy, sympathy, all of that. Uh, no one ever said, 
we don't believe that you're really in pain. However, when she turned uh, 18 and when it was that transition time to adult care, it was extremely traumatic. It was eye opening. It was scary because when you go from the adolescent side to the adult side, pediatric side from um, to the adult side, it's, it's completely night and day. It's, it's extremely unfortunate, but that's when we started seeing, okay, you're showing drug seeking behavior. You can't be in that much pain. That's when it started being questioned about not being believed, you know, not being believed that you're in pain. And I personally, like I said previously before, I personally do not know one adult with sickle cell disease that cannot, that does not have a horror story about how they were treated. And we have wonderful providers. We even have Dr. Alvarez, uh, who's the pediatric hematologist at the University of Miami, who's on our board. We have wonderful physicians. However, the majority is difficult. There's not a lot of education and understanding within the medical community, the general public, as well as the medical community. So I started seeing like my daughter was being mistreated. Um, it was extremely frustrating to say the least, to have to feel like you're being targeted when all you want is to feel better, that you you were born with a, a genetic disorder that you didn't have any control over. However, society and the community is viewing you as, you know, you're going in here just wanting the drugs. And as you stated before, sickle cell disease causes severe pain. So can you imagine like a healthy red blood cell that's plump moving through the arteries, the vessels and everything like that flowing smoothly. And when you have a sickle cell that's shaped like a half moon, imagine that trying to flow through the body. It gets jammed, it gets stuck, it's lacking oxygen. So that causes excruciating pain throughout the body. And my daughter has described it to me as like having a severe toothache over your entire body. So if you imagine how when you got a toothache, you can't even think straight. Right. You know what I mean? So and to me, I describe it from seeing other people as well as my daughter going through it. I describe it as I can only compare it to giving birth. That's the only thing I can like co compare it to being in labor. So if you can imagine like women who are have had kids out here, imagine being in labor for up to a week, sometimes two weeks in that type of pain, you know, and that's the type of pain that people with sickle cell go through. And it's very unfair that they get targeted like that. So when my daughter started getting, you know, older and things like that, and I saw that it wasn't a whole lot of resources out there, I reached out to my um, one of my good friends who also has sickle cell disease sickle cell disease, and she has a child with sickle cell disease. Um, she's also the vice president of our organization, Monique Favors. And I said, we need to do something about this. This is a, this is a epidemic. It's a problem, mm -hmm. you know, and there are many times, and I'm just being honest and transparent. There, there were many times in my journey with sickle cell disease that I questioned God. Mm -hmm. I was extremely angry because me, I dropped out of high school and I used to be very, very um, ashamed about that, you know, mm -hmm. and I thank God that now I am. God has released me from that of being ashamed of, of, of the things that I've had to go through. And I'm using that now as a testimony. But I did not graduate from high school. I had to get a GED because of my daughter being sick all the time. I couldn't. It was difficult for me to go to school and and do things like, you know, people my age were doing. Mm -hmm. So I had to go up very fast, you know, having a child with sickle cell disease. Mm -hmm. And our team at ASAP is extremely committed to the sickle cell community. I have to like shout them out. Stephanie Bankston, um, she's a nurse practitioner with over 25 years of caring for people with sickle cell. We just have an awesome and we all work together and we all have a strong passion with sickle cell disease. So that's how, uh, that's how we, we came about, uh, but I would educate. I would always educate anyone to find out, even if you're not thinking about having kids. Always, you need to know and educate yourself if you're a carrier of the sickle cell trait. Because I hate to hear when people find out when the child is born. Right. You know, like in my situation, I didn't know I had it until my daughter was actually born. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
Just stop me because at any point, because I can oh, just yeah. and, and, that's going not, on. and I'm glad you brought all that up, Kimba, because, you know, when you would think about somebody, you know, when you think about somebody with a disease that's so debilitating as sickle cell and it's so painful, you would think that the minute they enter a hospital that they will be given the red carpet treatment. But to hear that they're scrutinized and looked upon as being drug addicts or, you know, just trying to take advantage of getting free met drugs. It's very heartbreaking. And I, I hate to say it, it makes me wonder. A lot of people are not educated on this disease and you you hear it all the time and listening to a lot of the platforms that you're on with different medical professionals. A lot of people are saying that they didn't even know about sickle cell until they entered the hospital. They didn't teach them about that in nursing school. They didn't teach them about it, you know, in medical school. And because it primarily affects black and brown people. And that's another level of how the medical society is placing us in a box and not taking our lives seriously because it's affecting us at high rates. And like you said, Kimba, a lot of people, they don't know their status as far as having the, the trait. I know of people who have found out when they were pregnant or when they had a child, they were getting ready to have a child. And they said, oh, you have the sickle cell trait. At that point, it might be a little too late to, you know, what you can do but i've known that i've had the trade a lot of people in our family have the trade and we do have people with the disease but i guess seeing courtney firsthand you know seeing her go through what she went through it breaks my heart to think that someone would even question the validity of the the pain you know it's heartbreaking and with that being said, Kimba, yes. I want to ask you like about a lot of the work that you all are doing with ASAP. I know that you all go into the hospitals. You all have met with a lot of medical professionals. What has been the um, feedback or what has been the outcome of a lot of these meetings you've had? Because I know um, you all advocate for better treatment of sickle cell patients because I actually have a friend who lives right here in Atlanta. She refuses to go to the hospital because she has been treated so badly. She tries to, um, you know, you know, medicate her, not medicate herself, but heal herself at home holistically because she doesn't want to deal with, you know, going to the hospital and being judged or being viewed as a drug addict or anything like that. So what has been some of the outcome of these meetings that you all have had with the medical professionals? That's a great point. I, I can't. I'm so excited to get into that. But let me just backtrack a little bit. You said how you shared how your friend is hesitant about going to the hospital. So anybody on here who's watching, who's um, who doesn't have any medical problems, I just want to say, just imagine the last time you went to the emergency room. I'm pretty sure you didn't hesitate, or you didn't feel like you had to actually dress up before you went to the emergency room, you didn't feel like you had to present in a certain way. You were just worried about getting better. Now, the thing is with adults, a lot of adults with sickle cell feel like they have to actually dress up, present themselves well, hmm. in pain, sick, so that they aren't targeted. And that's a serious problem. That is a, that's very problematic. That's extremely problematic that people feel that they have to do that. And, and unfortunately, they do have to do that in a lot of cases. And, and it's so what a go ahead. No, go ahead. I didn't mean oh, to no, I was just gonna say that that brings up I went to a conference here for sickle cell um a few years back, and it was an actual doctor who <laughs> was advocating to you know advising patients to try and um you know manage their pain at home. And it like literally set a fire in me because as a medical professional who knows about this disease, why would you tell somebody to stay at home? But continue what you were saying, Kim, about, about people dressing up to go to the doctor and the hospital and all that. So they don't present themselves like they're an addict or something. Exactly. So they can pre and that's that's no one should be thinking like that. A hospital should be a place of help, not a place of, of fear. Mm -hmm. And there's been many times that I that I'm sitting at home with my daughter and she's screaming and crying not because so much yeah she's in pain she's not feeling well but she is begging me not to take her to the hospital you know what i mean and that is very very unfortunate and i also see ray on here who's also a caregiver and he's he's gone through the same thing we all have these these stories of our loved ones and the trauma of going <laughs> seeking care and that shouldn't be like that so I am very proud to say that ASAP has been instrumental in one of our local healthcare systems here in establishing a sickle cell task force. Awesome. This task force, yes, and how that came about was we just basically mobilized uh, several of our sickle cell warriors, caregivers, and we went to attend a board of commissioners meeting 
for the healthcare system. And we attended that meeting and we voiced our concerns and our grievances with the things that were taking place. And as a result of that meeting, they established a sickle cell task force with a clinical subcommittee and with the goal of trying to make a change within that healthcare system, uh, addressing the issues that the sickle cell warriors face. So uh, I'm very extremely proud of that. We have a long way to go. It's an uphill battle, but things like that do make a difference. Mm -hmm. And this week and next week, we're going to be doing patient uh, sickle cell warrior panels with Florida International University, as well as Nova Southeast University. We've done that in the past, but we're continuing that. So it's, it's extremely important to get in on the ground floor. Yes. with the medical community before they become indoctrinated against sickle cell warriors. I hate to say it like that, but it's true because you have a lot of uh, people that warn them beforehand. Okay. When you see one of them, Hey, they're going to give you a hard time. They're chronic complainers, you know, so automatically a lot of times they get red flagged and, and labeled and stereotyped, uh, you know, negatively without, you know, just cause. Mm -hmm. So that's why we, we go very hard in that area in terms of bridging that gap with the medical community and providing that education. Okay, Kimba, um, I, I, there's a question. How have persons with sickle cell disease been managing services during COVID? Well, of course, you know, uh, people with sickle cell disease are immunocompromised and we were listed as one of the chronic, uh, chronic diseases for the CDC. So of course we have to take you know, more precautions than the average person. Uh, most warriors that I know, including my daughter, they've been trying their best to avoid the hospitals. So you can imagine right now, the priority is COVID, rightfully so right now, because we are in a pandemic. However, because we're in a pandemic and sickle cell always, uh, warriors don't always get the best care. You can imagine it's kind of difficult right now. It's even more difficult than it normally is uh, for seeking care. Yes. Yeah, and I'm looking in the comments, and I saw when Leah said it was she was afraid to transition into adult care, and um, Stephanie is saying it's heartbreaking patients staying home in pain due to not receiving quality care. Advocacy is so important, and it really is so important. It's yes. very important, extremely important. So I want to go back a little bit because I mentioned earlier that I am a carrier of the trait, and many people, many Black and Brown people are carriers, and they don't even know it. So, Kim, if you can give a little bit of um, information about those who are carriers of the trait, aside from being able to um, possibly have a child with the disease, what other things can be affected? Like, how can a person with the trait be affected? I know we don't have the disease, but do you have some of the same symptoms or there, are there any other medical issues that can come of, you know, having the trait? Yes. And just to clear it up also, one in 12 African-Americans in the U.S. are carriers of the sickle cell trait. That's a lot. That's a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And one in 100 Hispanics also carry the sickle cell trait. And believe it or not, a lot of people don't know this. However, Florida has the highest rate of Hispanics with sickle cell disease. Mm -hmm. And Florida is in the top three states of people living with um, with sickle cell. So I just wanted to throw that in there mm -hmm. with sickle cell trait. The NCAA tests athletes now for that. So that shows you that it's important to know if you have the trait. You can, you need to stay hydrated. Some people, the trait will not affect them ever. But then you have some people that they will be affected by flying altitudes and things like that. They may have, you know, aches and pains at times. And there's also a form of kidney cancer that people with the trait can get. It's called renal medullary carcinoma, also known as RMC. Um, Dr. Tamia Austin brought this out to us, who has the AS1 Foundation. It's a rare cancer of the kidney that predominantly affects uh, young people of African descent, descent who carry the sickle cell trait, sickle cell disease, or other sickle hemoglobinopathies. So that's something that, you know, needs to be more research on with that. And I know myself personally, when I go and get like my general like labs and stuff, my trait shows up um very very prevalent yes so, mine does too mm -hmm. yes but over exertion there have been several athletes that have passed away um co collegiate athletes that have passed away due to sickle cell trait and being over exerted so if you have the trait i would recommend anybody if you're working out and things like that please you know pace yourself and stay hydrated 
Yes, I know. Um, I've all, I've thought about different things that, you know, when I have breakdowns in my body, I think about that sometimes because I have all of those symptoms. So I do attribute it sometimes to the trait. And Camila is asking, just like you said, um, will annual blood work with your primary care provider identify that you have the trait or should you request a specific trait? I know that's a regular to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have to request to be tested for the trait. A regular CBC won't um, give that information. You have to be, you know, request that. Mm -hmm. And so, Kimball, um, when we're talking about the trait, if uh, I want to talk, you know, how can someone come you have the disease? So it, it takes two parents with the trait, right? Both parent has to have the trait for it, the child to have the disease. And what is the um, probability of that happening? Of the yes, child if having a disease. Yes. Okay. So I have a I have a younger daughter as well. So she has the trait. It when two parents have the sickle cell trait, you have a twenty five percent chance each pregnancy of that child having the actual sickle cell disease. So it's a one in four chance. And a lot of people think that, you know, some people think like, okay, if you have four children, then that means the first one will have it. But it, it doesn't go like that. It's each single pregnancy. With two people having the trait, you have a 25% chance of your child having the actual disease. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I, I went to college with a young woman who was the fourth of six children, and she was the only one that had it. And same mother, same father, and she was the only one. So I just wanted people to be aware of that because a lot of people think like, oh, you know, automatically, you know, if you have the trait and I have the trait, the child is going to have the disease. It's not an automatic, but there there should be some precautions that should be put in place if you do know that both of you all have the trait. Um, Stacey, exactly. um, are there any effective methods of dealing with the pain? Yes, Stacey. Uh, most sickle cell warriors take opioids, you know. That's a whole nother um, Pandora's box with that too. I've had issues several times uh, with going to war almost with pharmacies regarding filling my daughter's prescriptions. Um, it's exhausting, to be quite honest with you. It, it gets it gets to the point where it gets overwhelming and exhausting being a caregiver or being someone living with sickle cell disease because you have to, you're fighting from all different angles, you know. Um, opioids, rest, uh, hot baths, hot packs, acupuncture, I've even tried uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy for my daughter. I mean, I've tried just about everything that you can think of um, to try to help relieve the pain. Massages and, and some things don't work for everyone, you know, and a lot of times they try to put sickle cell warriors in one big box and, and say like it's a cookie cutter disease. But what works for my daughter will not work for the next sickle cell warrior. You know what I mean? So it needs to be, I would say, more options. Many people don't agree with this. However, um, medical marijuana was approved down here in Florida. So if you meet the criteria for it, you can receive a medical marijuana card and you can go and receive, you know, the dis from the dispensary, you can reach receive, you know, medical marijuana, different things like that. And we I have personally my daughter has been qualified for that. So that's something that we have we have we have experimented with that, too, and tried that it does help. However, getting the dosage is right with that. That's a whole nother issue because making sure, like, how do you know which, you know, it's, it's like a trial and error type thing, you know, with that. So those are some of the things that we go through with, with trying to help with the pain. My daughter also uses CBD cream. That helps a lot. And Ms. Alma said hydration. Hydration is definitely important. Um, luckily, she does drink a lot already. Um, but it's definitely extremely important to stay hydrated. And right now we don't have any, the only cure we have for sickle cell right now is the bone marrow transplant. So, and that's not an option for everyone. You have to find a donor that matches. We're very blessed and, and, and happy to say we have two members of our organization that actually went through a successful bone marrow transplant. We have Natalie, who's, who was six, seven, when she went through her bone marrow and also Sebastian, they both went through su uh, successful bone marrow transplants, but that's just not the option for everyone. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's important. I believe that, you know, a lot of um, people of color, black and brown people, we need to become bone marrow donors. 
a lot of people do not sign up for that registry and don't, you know, think about that. But this is a way that we can help with the community. And I see Angela on. Hi, Angela. Angela is also a warrior. Thank you. Hi. Yeah. So um, thank you. And so let me see. What does it say? Hema, hemoglobin SC disease is a type of sickle cell disease. People who have hemoglobin SC disease have red blood cells that contain both hemoglobin S and hemoglobin C. Hemoglobin C trait awareness is important. Mm -hmm. okay. Definitely. And a lot of people consider uh, sickle cell hemoglobin SC as a milder form. However, I know several people that it affects them just as if they have SS. And a lot of times sickle cell SC uh, warriors can get blindness. They have a lot of issues with the eyes. And now sickle cell can affect the eyes too. And that's a whole nother thing that a lot of people aren't aware of. That's why education is important because the, the pain is the hallmark of the disease. That's the first thing you think of and that's the hallmark. Mm -hmm. However, there's a lot of complications that you can experience with sickle cell disease and your eyesight, your vision is one of them. You can have a crisis in your, um, the vessels in your eyes. So imagine that. So I know someone who actually is legally blind now uh, as a mm -hmm. result of, of their sickle cell disease. So there's a lot, it's, a, it's an extremely serious disease. And if I may say, it's the most common first documented genetic blood disorder in the United States. You know, mm -hmm. we're talking from 1910 that it was on record and we're in 2021 and we're having the same conversations. So that tells you how we're lacking, you know, how, how we still need a lot of resources and we still need a lot of help because we're underfunded as well. And it's still, still, still a lot of stigma and um, that exists with sickle cell disease, but that's why we, we're we here. Exactly. And I, I look at other communities and other diseases and, and how they mobilized and they've gotten their voices out there and they've gotten change. I mean, you can't go anywhere without seeing a pink ribbon or Susan G. Coleman with the breast cancer. So I think we can still do the same work here in the sickle cell community if we all just band together and get awareness out there. I think this is important. So with that being said, Kimba, um, you've definitely educated us today on a lot of things. Oh no, Leah said last year, yeah, she had bleeding in her right eye this year. That That's very, that's horrible. It's very sad. And Leah's a young woman. And so, you know, just a t she's a teenager, right? Yes. And like Stephanie said, there is a shortage of blood needed for transfusion. So blood donors are definitely needed. So yes. We need to be very um, adamant about getting our blood, you know, giving blood or becoming um, bone marrow donors. We need to be at the forefront of this, of these things. We really do. Definitely. And if no, we cannot depend on other people or sit around and wait. Because I mean, from 1910 to 2021, we're still, no, we cannot sit around any longer and wait for other people to say, okay, let's lead the charge. Let's do something. No, we need to do this together. It takes all of us. It takes a village. It takes all of us working together to make a difference. Oh, Kim. Um, yes, I have all the information on how to donate to ASAP. I'll be putting that right now and it'll be scrolling on the screen. So I'll put that up in a minute. But yes, and I recall going to um, an event at the Georgia State Capitol for Sickle Cell and it was a woman there and she was she was definitely, she had to be like in her 60s or so. And she was saying that she had a very rare form of sickle cell. It was called the Harlem um, form. Kimmy, had you ever heard that before? She was out of Harlem. I have not. Yeah, nobody had heard of it. Wow. But she was like one of the only people ever diagnosed with that one. But she was still here and she was down at the Capitol. So um, that was very interesting to hear that, you know, the different forms. And this woman was, you know, an older lady and she, she had been living with it all these years. And um, that is the um, information to donate. So Kimba, you've given us a lot of information. Um, can you tell us um, what other events um, ASAP have going on or upcoming events? They yes. Have going on? Yes, definitely. Uh, Saturday, September 18th. And another thing too, we're working on with our legislators with getting change made as well. Because mm -hmm. honestly, the things that we're doing is great. However, to really make real change is going to come from the halls of Congress. Yes. That's how we are going to, to make, we have to put laws in place that will protect sickle cell uh, warriors. And just like Leah said, Leah is 17 years old and she's afraid to transition to be an adult. That has to stop. Mm -hmm. We have to make it better for our adult sickle cell warriors, but we have to make it better for our next generation of sickle cell warriors that are coming 
through because they don't need to experience that, that level of discrimination and things like that. So on September 18th, we partnered with the city of Miami Gardens, Councilman uh, Robert Stevens, as well as Florida State Representative Felicia Robinson. And we're doing a sickle cell education workshop for the community. Mm -hmm. So if you are in the Miami Gardens area, please come. We're going to be social distance and, you know, taking precautions, but it's going to be a great event. We also, on that day, we have Be The Match that is going to come out and register people for the National Bone Marrow Registry. So if you're in the ages of 18 and 44, consider joining that registry. It's very simple. They just swab the inside of your mouth and you mail it back. And you never know, you can be that person that can probably save someone's life. Mm -hmm. And we also have one blood that will be there on that day as well, collecting blood donations. So if you're in the area or you know somebody in the area, please send them our way for that event. We also have a support group that we do every two weeks and you can follow us on our social media because we post all of our information and our upcoming events on there too. You can follow us on there and, and stay updated with everything. And um, thank you for the um, asking for the information to donate. Uh, we really appreciate that because mm -hmm. it takes a lot. It takes a lot to do everything that we do and we do not receive a whole lot of funding, but I'm believing that that's going to change very soon. But we do a lot for the funding that we do receive. Mm -hmm. um, Kim, it was a question. Stacy mentioned that one of her husband's good friends, he passed away in his early 20s um, from the disease of the 90s. Has the life expectancy changed since then for sickle cell? Yes. And I, I lost someone very close to me who was like a little brother at the age of 23 in mm -hmm. 2014. I, I lost him. Um, so, yes, the life expectancy has increased. We have now, just to backtrack a little bit, like I told you guys, 1910 is when sickle cell was discovered and it's the first documented, most common genetic disorder. However, 2017 is when we got our very first FDA approved drug. Can you imagine that? Something has been on record for a hundred years and we got our very first FDA approved drug, which was in Dari. Hydroxyurea was treated, was used to treat sickle cell, but that was not you know, set forth specifically for sickle cell disease. So that's when we got our very first drug. So that tells you like we got, uh, we have a long way to go. We do have four treatments now. Thank God for that. Mm -hmm. So the life expectancy has increased now as a result of that. So that's great. That is excellent. Yes. And also just to share a little transparent, more transparent moment with you. Uh, Yesterday, we had an event with the top ladies of distinction, and we talked about sickle cell and things like that. And Stephanie has shared the like the psychosocial aspect of it. A lot of people don't understand the toll it takes on you psychologically um, having sickle cell, because for a very long time, you could not tell my daughter happy birthday. Because every time we would celebrate her birthday, it would be a, it would signify her getting closer to death. And I had to change that narrative. For her because she she's been told her entire life she's not going to make it past a certain age so birthdays became horrible you know and I, you guys used to text her call her and she wouldn't respond like happy birthday because she she just didn't want to deal with that and that takes a toll on you psychologically after a while when you keep hearing so much negativity all the time we have several sickle cell warriors that are a part of our organization by the grace of God. They are living past 60 years old. So we could, we choose to believe the report of the Lord. So and we have several inspirations within our organization. And we, we recently met a 77 year old with sickle cell disease. So stories like that, that gives us hope. Yeah. And that, and that takes me back to a friend I had when I was in college. She um she was definitely. Um, you know, didn't like to celebrate birthdays. She would always say, because at that time she was in her twenties and she was, you know, a little older than the rest of us. Cause she started school late, you know, due to being sick and all that kind of stuff or whatever. But she was like, I'm at the age now that they told me I wouldn't make it. So just to hear somebody in their early twenties, say something like that, it, it's heartbreaking. It's extremely heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's extremely heartbreaking. I try to tell my daughter, like, don't compare yourself to someone else. Even if you are, it might take you a little longer than the average person your age, but that doesn't mean you're denied. 
it may take you a little longer, but you have to still keep pushing. And I say that to all sickle cell warriors as well, because I'm telling you, sickle cell warriors are the most resilient. I, I've never met people, and I'm, I'm being honest. I'm not just saying it because my daughter has it. Can you imagine coming into the world like suffering and struggling so much and you still keep pushing forward? They are amazing individuals. Absolutely. So, Kimba, what can people do in their states if they're not in Florida and they can't, you know, just work directly with ASAP? What can people do around the country? Because I know we have some folks from Georgia on right now, different places. What what can they do to help in the cause to bring awareness? I would say con definitely. And we need that. And I would say contact your local state legislators and get involved. See what their initiatives are. Do they have anything they're doing for sickle cell? If so, join in with them. There's also another organization called Six Cells that does a lot of national le legislation, legislative advocacy. I would say, you know, get on their mailing list and see what they're doing as well. But it's very important because we cannot do this alone. We, we, we just can't do it. And we, it, we're, at a, we're at a time now where I don't want to have this same conversation again in terms of how we're being treated and how we're not, we're, we're so far behind. Like I'm ready to start now, like giving all the good reports now, you know, Absolutely. but it's definitely going to take all of us, you know, working to make this difference. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, the people who are on right now, they are change makers. I feel it in my spirit. We're all going to get involved in this cause. I am proudly wearing my ASAP shirt today, even though I'm in Georgia, but thank you, Kimba, for my shirt. <laughs> so I'm wearing my ASAP shirt today. <laughs> Um, and also, if you see streaming at the bottom of the screen, I have um, where you can, when you purchase through Amazon, use smile.amazon.com and choose Advancing Sickle Cell Advocacy Project when you purchase, because 5% of your 5% um, of your checkout will go towards a donation to um, ASAP. And I, I keep, and I, I know all of us order from um, Amazon a lot, especially during the pandemic, I order from them a lot. And I always use Smile so <laughs> that my donation can go to um, ASAP. So definitely make sure you do that. And all of these links will be in the description section on um, the YouTube um, page for the video. So it'll all be listed there. So Kimba, anything else that you want to share with us before we close out today? No, I just thank you for having me. I thank you for the conversation. Anytime that I can share about sickle cell, it's my passion. And, and like I said before, I used to question God many times. Why would you give me a child that's so sick? And many times I would be in my room just like crying at night. Like people don't even understand the level of what it takes having a child that's so sick. And then nobody really understands it. You tell them, oh, they're in the hospital. Oh, is she better? And then a lot of people don't even understand. When you come out of the hospital, it's a whole other phase you go through having sickle cell, the recovery part of it. And then you get sick again. You know, so it's very difficult to explain. But I have come to the realization now that this is what the Lord wants me to do, mm -hmm. to be one of the people to try to evoke change for the sickle cell community. So I have now gone from questioning God to, to thanking God and, 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 and thanking him for using me and others to be, you know, a beacon of light for those living with sickle cell disease. So, well, thank you. But I mean, that was a beautiful way to close out. And like I said before, you know, I know firsthand just from watching Courtney and, you know, watching what Kimmel went through and just our family in general dealing with, you know, sickle cell anemia. And that's why sickle cell disease, that's why I know it's so important that we must be educated and we must know our status so that we can definitely spread it and we can make some change in this world. So thank you all for joining today. And as I always say, do one thing every day that will make you absolutely happy. And we want you all to get involved in your community as far as with sickle cell. So if you're in the South Florida um, area, definitely um, try and reach out to ASAP. They need all the volunteers they can get. So I, yes, I really definitely encourage you all to do that and just spread awareness to your your friends and your family. Just your, start within your local community. That would definitely yes. help. So yeah, uh, start the conversation. That's what I would say. Start start the conversation. Yeah. Do you have the trait? Hey, exactly. have, do you know, like start start that conversation. Yes. And I, I also want to share also, Jamila, that we have a, a workshop coming up very soon. So please follow us on social media, like us on social media as well. Mm -hmm. And the, the name of that workshop is Know Your Rights. We're having a legal workshop that's coming up because mm -hmm. there's a lot that uh, people with sickle cell don't know that they, they, they have rights to do, you know, yeah. they don't have to stand for certain things. So we're going to be doing that very soon too. That sounds great. 
Oh, we love you, Madam President Kimba. Great conversation, Stephanie says. And Stephanie is definitely Thank very you, dedicated. And she's she did a great job yesterday on that um, panel. I watched it on Top Ladies of Distinction. It was an excellent panel. So thank you all for all your work and, and go out and have a great and beautiful Sunday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Thank you for watching. And don't forget to subscribe to this channel. Hit the notification bell and share and like this video. Thank you. Bye-bye.